So we have been here before with Dr. Robert Chuck. He's the most famous geologist. Uh, yeah, everyone know him. And he explained for us how, how he sees this through geology. And uh, we have also Susan with us, who is going to be our techno-spiritual geologist from this day further. And what we want to say basically that the horizontal erosion that we see here is not the water erosion because it descends, as you can see, it goes lower with the level and this cannot be water basically because water levels itself and that the vertical erosion we see here in the all this area and here in the back down here this is the real water erosion from rainwater that never been the climate of the Sahara here uh -huh. of the desert here as he said, 9,700 BC. Is the conservative estimate for when the, the water erosion occurred? This is when, when that weather was not here, right. 9,700. It's been desert conditions since then. Exactly. Right. And also the rounded nature is... When he first came here with John Anthony West in 1992 and looked up here, he said, this is clear textbook evidence of water erosion, rounded layer. And now we know further from the tour he just did with the Kemet tour, he explained on video that he has mapped every stratigraphic layer of here, every different layer, because limestone, as Susan will attest to, forms heterogeneous, not homogeneous. You have a hard layer, softer layer, harder layer, softer layer, harder layer, and he mapped the erosion of every layer, and he can date what time it was eroded on. And so we have come up with an estimate that there was an event here 30,000 years ago known as the Mosterian subpluvial. Only time it rained that much in Africa to cause this type of erosion. And I discussed that with Susan last year, that we should have a benchmark here at least 30,000 years. And off record, Dr. Shock said to Yusuf, it could be 80,000 years. What do you think, Susan? What, what we also want to do, do this is how that this does this dates the Sphinx. Uh -huh. right. Because the same water erosion is All in the, the Sphinx. Body of the Sphinx. Uh -huh. yes. So that means that the, just basically, that the water erosion of the Sphinx dates it to being at Cannot, least... At least 9,700 BC. BC. Geology and I go timeline. by the paleoclimatology record which says 30,000 years ago. But that would mean that it was sculpted at least 5,000 years prior to the dynastic Egyptians being in existence in this area. Correct. Exactly. Okay. And at Susan? Least, uh, these are all limestones. You can see the difference in here. This one up here you can see corals, shells, various things. It was almost a reefal material, whereas this would be a, a muddy limestone. This back into a more competent limestone, and that is the natural way that the rock will erode. Those vertical ones are not the natural way the rock will erode. That is from water erosion, whereas this is the, the normal way it will erode. So what we can see is the fact that this Massive sculpture has been repaired over and over and over. Uh, probably through the dynastic times and all the way through to the 20th century, which makes it a complete mess if you want to figure out the original design. But what is clearly obvious is as we go up, you see the erosion layers. You see how heavy the erosion is. There's another repair. But when you get to the head, you can see that the head is barely eroded. And that clearly indicates that the head was recarved long after this erosion took place. As well, there are many accounts through history, including, I believe, during the dynastic times, where this, which is called the Sphinx enclosure, was filled with sand. And so, over the hundreds of years, the Sphinx was dug out, the sand was taken away, but then the wind would blow the sand back in. So that means that for a high percentage of the time, the Sphinx's body was covered in sand, and the sand would protect it from wind erosion, and yet the head would have been exposed above that surface. So the fact that the, the face and the head are not highly eroded clearly indicates that the Sphinx's head was recarved at least once afterwards, after all the erosion, possibly many times. So you can't identify the age of the Sphinx itself 
with the face that is being portrayed because the face was supposedly the representation of one of the so-called Pharaoh's mothers. He had the face recarved. Another curious thing is that people are looking for what are called the Halls of Records or the Hall of Records underneath the Sphinx. And it's no coincidence that this boardwalk here has been put in place. It's not simply there in order for people to walk on it so they don't get their shoes dirty, but we've been told by an inside source that the opening or entrance to the tunnel system under the Sphinx is under this boardwalk. So the reason why this is called the Sphinx enclosure is because the bedrock was cut out in order to reveal the shape of the body, as you can tell. Uh, also, we've heard that the erosion, at least the water-based erosion, is at least 10,000 years old, making the body of the Sphinx at least 5,000 years older than the dynastic Egyptian. Zzz. And people talk about the idea, again, that there are tunnels and or chambers under the Sphinx. And here we see clearly that this could be an entrance. It's hard to tell how far down it goes. There is a ladder going down, but whether it has been refilled or whether it's solely this deep is hard to tell because of the darkness. Now the question of uh, how the material was removed in order to uh, create the body of the Sphinx and the Sphinx enclosure is very fascinating because rather than the idea of a bunch of people with um, adzes or bronze axes or bronze shovels or chisels or whatever, in fact, the material was removed in the form of massive blocks. And so that's what you're looking at. We have Jeffrey here and the ancient builders, pre-dynastic, removed these massive blocks of limestone from the Sphinx enclosure and created what we now call the Sphinx Temple out of it. And it is not simply this wall we're looking at. So it wasn't that a few blocks were removed <coughs> because you can see the amount of volume involved. And this is where we find all of those blocks here in the remains of the Sphinx Temple. And the even more amazing aspect about this is, as you can see here, it looks as if they cut a block out, put it into place, cut the next block from the enclosure, put it into place, because look at the horizontal um, lines of different layers of hardness. Another block was removed from the enclosure and put into place there. And we see that in many cases, like over again at the wall you're looking at. Now something that reinforces the idea that there are levels of chambers or tunnels under the Sphinx is that as you can see, it was constructed on bedrock. That's the bedrock and this is also the bedrock. But as we approach the front paws, there's a transition between the bedrock and these, which are clearly inserted and could be the roof of a chamber, the chamber lying underneath the paws. Also, what we can see up here is uh, evidence that um, the officials were drilling into the bedrock in order to see if there was an underground chamber but have a look at the locations of where the actual drill holes are. 
So this is about halfway down the body of the Sphinx. And you can see these caps are on top of uh, angle drilling, core drilling, I believe in the 90s or perhaps after that, in order to see if there are holes or chambers or tunnels under the Sphinx as we round the basically the elbow and here we have another one and here we have another one but again what's curious is the transition between the bedrock here <coughs> and these obvious blocks which were set into place. They're, they're basically at ground level. So do they represent a cover over top of the chamber? And is the front access to the Sphinx, in fact, right in this area here, covered by the boardwalk? Because again, when we go to this side, the bedrock is there, the slabs are here, continuing all the way to the end of the other paw, where again we have the bedrock.